Hi, it's Ronald, the Rules Lawyer, and I have made no secret of the fact that I want to popularize Pathfinder 2nd Edition, and I've been running the system for D&D YouTubers in a Patreon-exclusive series of the Abomination Vault's Adventure Path. And a point of frustration that came up in our sessions was, surprisingly, the three-action economy, and the fact that it costs you an action to interact with an object, it takes one action to climb five feet, and some of the YouTubers talked about possibly house-ruling these things. And I don't think this desire is exclusive to them, and I think it's pretty common among people, especially who come from D&D 5th edition over to Pathfinder. And I wanted to address this in this video, because the three-action economy is often touted as everyone's favorite part of the system. However, crucial to the three-action economy working are these decisions to make some things cost an action, and also the multiple attack penalty, which I also saw a desire to house rule. So I'm going to defend these decisions in the system, talk about why they're there, and talk about why you should not change them in your games. I'm Ronald, the Rules Lawyer, and I'm a lawyer who also taught middle school students in an after-school program tabletop RPGs. I have about 10 years experience running Pathfinder 1st and 2nd edition and D&D 5th edition. If you like this content, subscribe to my channel and get further videos. So this is the issue. The three action economy is freeing when you first encounter it. You have three actions and they're all equal, they're all the same, and some things cost one action, others cost two, others cost three. It's straightforward. You don't have to worry about, is this my bonus action? And can I do two bonus actions in a turn, which you can't in 5e. No weird rules. You can move your speed three times, you can attack three times. Things in 5th edition that cost you your one action, things like moving more than your speed, making your attack, helping an ally, trying to hide. These all cost one of your three actions in Pathfinder. And also, most enemies in Pathfinder don't have opportunity attacks, and so you're able to move around the battlefield more freely. But, however, there are things that were free in 5th edition that now cost an action in Pathfinder. I defend the benevolent tyranny of Pathfinder's 2nd edition. There are rules there, and you need to follow them for your own good. And I need to uh, convey, too, that I'm not against homebrew. In fact, I did a video last year on five rules in Pathfinder that I think should be ignored by Pathfinder players. But I think it's important before homebrewing anything in a system to think first why that rule is there before you change anything to it. And I think these rules, some things costing an action, other rules I'll go over in this video, are there for a good reason. And they're essential for Pathfinder feeling like a deep tactical game. So I'll go over these changes one by one and also make general observations about Pathfinder and why I think it's a good system. So the first complaint is that you cannot break up movement in Pathfinder. In D&D 5th edition, you're allowed to move up to your speed during your turn. You can do your action in the middle of your movement. And this is what many 5e players call breaking up your movement. You can walk up to something, kill it with your weapon, and then move on to another enemy with the rest of your movement. Compared to its predecessor, 3rd edition and 1st edition Pathfinder, there definitely is more movement in 5th edition, and this is one of the reasons for that. But Pathfinder makes it cost one action to move up to your speed. So even moving 5 feet will cost you that action, and if you attack and kill an enemy with a strike as your second action, if you want to move further, you'll have to move stride again with your third action. This feels limiting to people coming over from 5e who are used to not having to spend a resource to move farther. But let's look at some of the issues uh, in how 5e approaches movement. First, there in reality isn't a whole lot of movement if you are a melee fighter when you go up to something. So long as that opponent you're attacking is not dead yet, you don't want to move away because that would trigger an opportunity attack. So Moving doesn't happen a whole lot in 5e games, uh, and many 5e players will admit this. Another issue is if you are a ranged attacker, um, you have a very good move uh, to an incentive to hide behind cover, total cover, let's say around the corner of a building, and walk out, fire with your bow, and use the rest of your movement to make yourself completely unattackable to the enemy again. This is also true for ranged spellcasters. It's a big buff to ranged fighting in the system, where arguably many 5e players would agree that ranged fighting probably is too powerful compared to melee fighting, if you add all of the pros and cons together. So what Pathfinder does is, okay, sure, if you're an archer, you can come out from behind the corner of that building, and you can attack, you can do that. However, you now have a choice 
Do you make a second attack or do you retreat back behind that corner? And spellcasters have a bigger problem because many of their attack spells require two actions. So if they come out from that safe hiding place and attack with a cantrip, let's say, they have used up all of their actions and they're now out in the open. This is a function of the fact that in the three action economy, everything that you can do is exchangeable for each other using the same single resource actions. And we see a theme here that's going to run throughout this video in that you often have more things you want to do than you have actions for. And this leads to interesting decisions. And a god among game designers, Sid Meier, who designed the Civilization computer game series, one of his famous quotes is that a strategy game is a series of interesting decisions where you can't accomplish everything you want and you have to weigh the pros and cons of various very attractive choices. It's that push and pull of different things jostling for your attention that makes it interesting. And in the sniper example, you are trying to weigh more offense versus defense. Do you want to take that greater risk in order to get greater reward? Depends on the situation. And there's a well-known video on YouTube right now that talks about how the magic missile spell which lets you fire magical darts, one for each action you spend on it. This uh, commenter said the most optimal thing to do is to only spend three actions to cast magic missile. Sure, looking in a vacuum, if you are looking only at how you're using your daily resources and DPR, yes, you kind of are wasting the spell when you spend only two actions on it and do less damage. But that doesn't take into account the fact that if you're spending three actions to fire off three missiles, you're standing in place and giving up the many other things that you can do with your actions. In Pathfinder, you have to not only juggle the spell slots you have for the day, but also how you use your in-combat resource of your three actions per turn. Having different pools of resources competing for each other is also part of interesting decisions. There's a very good post on the Pathfinder 2E subreddit on the role of opportunity costs in Pathfinder 2E's design, in how it designs its actions and also class feats. And I recommend people take a look at it. I'll have a link in the video description. Two more upsides about not being able to do everything you want on your turn is that it forces you to do something different every turn. You're, you're not able to do everything you want and you have to consider turn to turn the different things demanding your attention. The other upside is that this means your decisions matter more in combat. And for those who want to have a more tactical game that rewards good decisions in combat, that doesn't simply have you win at character creation, this is a plus for the system. And I'm going to make another point, uh, which will be another running theme throughout this video, which is that you can game these rules against your enemies. Let's look at how the inability to break up movement lends to greater tactics in combat. In 5th edition, if you are 15 feet away from a foe, it kind of doesn't mean anything because you for free can move up to that ogre and vice versa. And one of the co-designers of Pathfinder 2E, Mark Seifter, I'm going to play a clip from one of his streams where he explains this better than I can. Mm -hmm. It's so that movement matters. Because if you can split your movement whenever you want, mm -hmm. then there's only... You can actually just completely abstract away movement down into one of two situations. Situation one, your movement is like not higher than your opponent's. So at this point, no matter what or how you move, they just move up to you. Now, mm -hmm. if everybody's got a text of opportunity or other reactions or things like that, they may be flying off. So <laughs> movement sort of matters in the fact that you're all triggering lots of attacks of opportunity from each other, but it otherwise doesn't because it's not like they used anything to get to you and you didn't use anything to get away. You just used your split movement. Uh, the other situation is you are faster than them, whether it's because you tripped them in 5e and they have their movement or you just naturally have such fast movement that you're already like doubled their speed and you could move in, hit them with all your attacks, then move out and then they can't move without dashing. So the, in 5e, it's kind of binary. It's either like 
either it doesn't do anything mm -hmm. other than you guys opportunity attacking each other or they lose their entire turn and there's nothing in between and usually they won't lose their entire turn so um yeah absolutely it's to make movement actually really meaningful and the way that, that to do that is uh mm -hmm. basically not letting you split up it, uh for free and this also means in 5e that if you were to move away from that ogre and risk an opportunity attack you accomplish nothing because that ogre could just for free without consequence walk up to you and do what it would have done before but in pathfinder if you do that and many monsters do not have opportunity attacks including the ogre then that ogre needs to spend one of its three actions to go up to you in pathfinder because there's no opportunity attacks if you were able to break up your movement then you would go in make an attack and at no consequence no cost then move away and they would do the exact same thing. They would move, attack you, and then move away from you. It becomes this kind of song and dance. But just like with the going around the corner to snipe example, when the ogre walks in to you, and it now has a strategic choice of attacking two times and staying within the reach of your fighter, or using that last action to get in a safer position. Of course, <laughs> Pathfinder players will know that Valoros here actually has a attack of opportunity, now called Reactive Strike, in the remaster, and will punish that ogre for trying to walk away. However, that is an exception. So not being able to break up movement lends weight to that decision to walk away. And if Valoros, let's say, takes a feat uh, called Fleet to get a five-foot bonus to his speed, if he's faster than the ogre, basically, this now costs the ogre two actions to walk up to the fighter. And if you play Pathfinder enough, you know that when you're dealing with a higher level foe, let's say you're level one dealing with a level three ogre, yes, they can hit you three times and will hit you really hard as well. So you want to deny them those attacks. There are also monsters who have very powerful three action activities that if you force them to move, you will prevent them from doing it at maximum efficacy. And those who have followed the Rules Lawyer Cinematic Universe and followed my Abomination Vaults campaign will know that this can be quite powerful. <laughs> this kind of feeds into the next point, which is the fact that it costs an action to move. But it also costs an action, a whole action, to stand up from prone. And also actions like climbing and swimming are frustratingly slow to what people coming from 5e are used to. So first of all, with our example, um, striding costing an action is part of what we just went over. It makes distance and positioning matter. Now, using your action to shove an enemy away in Pathfinder actually does something because it costs them an action to get back up to you. Also, knocking an enemy prone will have a consequence. Now they have to spend an action to stand up. And if you move away, um, you cost them two actions to have to stand up and stride to you. Now, of course, if you are Valoros the fighter, maybe you want to stand right there and trip them because if the ogre were to stand up, doing a move action while in your threatened space triggers your attack of opportunity reactive strike and gives you another attack outside your turn, in addition to costing them an action. This means that shoving and tripping enemies, whereas in 5e, they often feel useless, has a lot of real power and consequence in Pathfinder. Also, climbing, um, when you succeed on it, takes you only five feet up an incline. And if you critically succeed, you can go up 10 feet. This is slower than what you can do in D&D, where moving five feet up costs you 10 feet of movement. And of course, that movement is free. Well, first of all, I would point out that an action takes about two seconds in game, and climbing five feet is pretty impressive if you ask me. Another complaint is that each of these actions is separate. Striding, climbing. So if you walk up to a wall, climb up it, and then continue walking, that's actually three actions. Again, I just point out that this applies to the enemies as well. It gives more consequence to the terrain. Also, Pathfinder spells out that the GM might want to allow some actions to combine within reason such as when a creature wants to jump vertically to get something and needs to move just a bit first to get in range before leaping, and then continue moving after that. The GM might make this cost two actions instead of three in this case. This language is from the Game Mastery Guide. 
But this also demonstrates another cool thing about the three action economy in that it's easier to homebrew, make up actions um, and costs for creative ideas from the players because you can just say it costs one, two or three actions instead of having to agonize over whether it is a bonus action or an action that prevents you from doing anything else on your turn or is part of your free movement. Okay, the next thing that uh, players might want to house rule that I recommend against is the multiple attack penalty. The way it works, many of you are already aware, is that you have a minus five penalty on your second attack on your turn, and it's minus 10 with your third and subsequent attacks. Uh, smaller if the weapon you're using is an agile weapon. I have it in this video about the three action economy because it's an essential part of the three action economy. The system allows you to attack three times and it wants to disincentivize doing that. Why think of any other actions such as debuffing an enemy if uh, you can just make the enemy dead? The best condition is dead. Without this penalty, then every turn would be similar because you'd just be trying to whack people to death um, and combat devolves into a DPR race. Pathfinder sets up many other actions that you can do besides attack, which I won't go into detail in this video. Uh, my companion video, my Pathfinder Law School video about the three action economy and everything you can do within it will answer that. But back to using things against enemies. Uh, one of the strong things you can do in this game is to grapple a creature. This gives them the grabbed condition. They cannot use any move actions and they are off guard or flat footed to attacks from all of your allies much more penalizing than the grappled condition in 5e. And this makes them want to get out of the grapple. So what they have to do is try to escape it. And this costs an action to the enemy. And it also has the attack trait. So if you can grapple that creature uh, and force them to try to escape in order to avoid that debuff, then you cost them their most accurate attack that turn if they do that first. They can then continue to try to attack you, but they now have a minus five penalty uh, to their attack. And that is makes grappling very powerful in this game. So make the multiple attack penalty work for you. Okay, next, uh, another complaint is having to raise your shield. In 5e and pretty much every other D&D edition and Pathfinder first edition, your shield just gave you a passive bonus to your armor class. You just assume it's always there defending you. But here in Pathfinder, you have to spend an action every turn in order to get that bonus from your shield. Most shields give you a plus two armor class bonus while your shield is raised. So people complain that this locks down their actions. They have to do it every turn in order to get the benefit. Um, well, first of all, this goes back to an earlier point. What it gives you is another option on your turn. There are some turns where you want to prioritize defense over offense. It provides another interesting choice. And it also, I think, underestimates the power of a plus two bonus in Pathfinder to your armor class. Because when you see a plus two or a plus one in Pathfinder, if you're coming from another edition, you want to double that number in your mind because of the four degrees of success system in Pathfinder. Getting a plus two to your armor class not only reduces the chance of that enemy hitting you, but drastically reduces their chance of critically hitting you. Let's look at that ogre. If you are level one um, and get the best AC you can, unless you are a monk or have heavy armor, your armor class will be 18. The ogre's attack is plus 12, so they can hit you by rolling a six on the die, or they can critically hit you by rolling a 16. If you just raise your shield, then you reduce the chances of them critically hitting you from 25% to 15%. That's a 40% reduction of them critically hitting you. In other cases, that percentage becomes higher. And let's look at their average damage. Uh, D10 plus 7, that averages out to about 12. When they critically hit you, in Pathfinder, you double everything, including the flat bonus. So it doubles and the ogre hook Many Pathfinder weapons have special traits, and the Ogre Hook has the Deadly D10 trait. So when the Ogre critically hits with their Ogre Hook, they add a D10 on top of their doubled damage. So the average damage goes from 12 to 30. Then you add the fact that many characters, especially some martial characters, will start with the shield block reaction. When they take damage and their shield is raised, when they take physical damage, they can use this reaction to reduce the incoming damage. For steel shields, they can reduce that by 5. 
As you level up, you can get sturdy shields that can reduce that incoming damage by a greater number. I've seen situations where a shield saved their bacon. It's happened many times. Where, in this case, you can prevent a critical hit doing 30 damage, reduce it to 12 damage, and shield block to reduce that to 7 damage. It's basically another powerful defensive, almost think of it as a class feature, that you can have. And the shield block reaction can be gained by any character in the game as a general feat. Oh, and all characters are proficient with shields. Another complaint I've seen is that recall knowledge costs an action. This is like the last point in that it can be very powerful. At least with a GM who is running it the way I do, <laughs> according to my video in which I propose how to fix recall knowledge, because as written, it's vague, and there's a way to read it that makes it too weak at some tables. But basically you should, and they're gonna be doing this with the remaster, they're gonna clarify the fact that basically the player can ask any question and the GM will answer it if they succeed. Such as, what is their lowest defense? Or what are some of its damage weaknesses? This is very powerful information and Pathfinder has, with pretty much every monster, special abilities that are useful to know, to counter, and some defenses that are much weaker than others. In this case, a hunting spider has a reflex of plus nine and a will of only plus five. So better to attack the will defense if you are thinking of different spells. The spider swarm has weakness to area damage or splash damage of five. So that seemingly measly alchemist bomb you, that you throw that does splash damage of one will trigger this weakness and do five additional damage. They also have different resistances to different physical damage types. Very valuable information. If the GM makes it worth their while, then Recall Knowledge creates yet another interesting decision in combat, should they spend that action doing so. Okay, next is an action to interact with an object. If you don't have any weapons in your hand when you start combat, it takes an action to pull out a weapon. If you want to switch weapons in battle, if you want to stow away your sword and switch your bow, for example, that's two actions. If you have a two-handed weapon and you let go one hand in order to do something like open a door or use your medicine kit, there's even an action to restore your grip on that two-handed weapon, as you can see here. So let's say you're wielding a great sword and you want to drink a healing potion. Release a hand, free action. Pull out your potion, interact action. Drink the potion, interact action. A third action to restore your grip on your sword. And also when you interact, it has the manipulate trait. So if that enemy has reactive strike or attack of opportunity, they can hit you while trying to do so. So I've seen people complain about this from 5e especially because they're used to interacting being a free action. At first, I would say to folks who think that way, maybe you're looking at 5e with rose tinted glasses. Because yes, you can do one free interaction. However, if you do a second interaction on your turn, such as when you want to interact with more than one object on your turn, it uses your action um, and you can't do anything else. Uh, you can't do an action at least. Many 5e DMs work around this rule, but at that point they're in house ruling territory. And in fact, with a lot of the complaints that I've seen with Pathfinder 2e, I wonder sometimes whether their tables and their GMs are actually running the rules. Or maybe their DM is running a set of house rules and has borne the rules burden for their players and for the designers. Also, if you had two weapons you were dual wielding, it cost you your use an object action to pull out both weapons, unless you took a feat. Also, as with everything else we've gone through, you can game this against enemies. So let's say you have a archer that you are attacking. The fighter, the melee fighter, can walk up to that archer. Let's say that archer wants to now switch to a melee weapon. Well, doing that will cost them an action. And if you have reactive strike yourself, you get a free attack against that archer. This also gives consequence to the terrain. Let's say you open a door and you see a room of dangerous monsters that are ready to pounce on you. Well, one of the most effective things you can do if you are an adventuring party in a dungeon and you encounter that situation is to close the door. <laughs> that creates a bottleneck and the enemy now has to walk up to it, spend an action, and if they want to walk farther, remember you cannot break up your movement, they have to spend a third action to walk through the door. So again, what's good for the goose is good for the gander. So why these rules on taxing you for changing your weapon loadout? Well, we get to the fact that 
Pathfinder has made it so that different weapon loadouts have their own strengths and weaknesses. And they want to cost you something if you want to switch from one loadout to another. And also reward your preparation if you have a weapon in your hand when combat breaks out in a dungeon, first of all, but also have the right loadout for a particular situation. So what are those loadouts? Well, uh, Valoros on the left is dual wielding. He has two weapons in hand. In Pathfinder, that lets you have a strong weapon that you lead with, and you can then make subsequent attacks that are with a weapon that has the agile trait that has a smaller multiple attack penalty. There are also feats, definitely for a fighter, that give you benefits for dual wielding. Valoros on the right is wielding a shield. This is often colloquially called sword and board. I've gone over the benefits of having a shield in combat already. Uh, don't need to go into that again. Uh, another style is to have one free hand and a one-handed weapon. In Pathfinder, you need a free hand to grapple, trip, shove, or disarm a creature. You need a free hand to use an object, such as a potion, or to use your medicine kit to try to heal somebody in the middle of combat. Having a free hand gives you flexibility to do that, and that's why it costs an action to restore your grip on your two-handed weapon, which the two-handed weapons are the ones that do the most damage or have the most advantageous traits. If it did not cost you an action to restore your grip onto your great sword, then you would have the benefit of a free hand fighter without any of the drawbacks. And lastly, we have people who fight with no weapons, like monks or barbarians with the animal instinct. They have the most flexibility with use of their hands. They can have two objects in hand, they can climb, do other things in the battle easily. So like the point near the beginning, interesting decisions. By deciding before combat what you're holding in hand, it gives consequence to that action. And also when you are kidding out your character, what their feats are and what equipment they're holding, they could possibly have two of these fighting styles, let's call them. But that versatility is powerful. And so there needs to be an action cost to counteract that. Okay, the cost of interacting also comes up when you are knocked out in Pathfinder, because when you are knocked out, you drop everything you're holding. This could be particularly painful for people who are wielding two things in combat. They have the action cost of not only standing up, but getting their equipment back. This is one of the several ways Pathfinder prevents what in 5e circles is often called yo-yo healing, where you can get knocked out in 5e, but an ally can bring you up with a bonus action spell like Healing Word, and you can get up and essentially you lost nothing. This has created a strange meta um, in 5e where you only heal somebody if they're actually knocked out. For some tables, this breaks disbelief. If you think about it, getting knocked out will fuck you up. And in combat, this does lead to an oh crap moment when someone in the party gets knocked out. It lends to the drama and makes it have a consequence. And it also incentivizes healing somebody before they get knocked out. It makes it interesting uh, how you want to use the heal spell. Do you want to spend the two action version to get that bonus hit points when you heal? Or do you want to wait for somebody to be knocked out and you can raise not only one, but several of your allies up from unconsciousness with the three action version, but without the bonus healing? Again, interesting decisions. I also saw the complaints about interaction when it came to climbing a wall. <laughs> when you want to climb in Pathfinder, you need to have both hands free. And when you want to have your weapons with you, when you climb that incline, you have to put your stuff away. This was a pain point as well. Again, I would refer to real life climbing um, and ask people to climb half their speed up a wall with a sword in hand. <laughs> it's not easy. Again, this lends consequence to terrain. Also, you can take a skill feat called Combat Climber to reduce the number of hands you need to climb by one. And hey, uh, that allows you to fight uh, while climbing, but you must have a one-handed weapon, uh, further disincentivizing two-handed weapons, which, like the other fighting loadouts, has its own strengths. Before going back to the point of benevolent tyranny, I'm going to point out a couple of Examples, additional examples of action taxes, so let's call them. Uh, one is to fly. Um, it costs one action to fly, 
obviously, just like striding. However, it also says that if you're airborne at the end of your turn and did not use a fly action this round, you fall. So that means you effectively have an action tax when you are flying in this game. That is one way to balance flying in the system and make it not an auto pick that you give to every character once you get access to the magic. Also, um, an interesting decision was to make grabbing an edge uh, a reaction because you only have one reaction per round. And if you are shoved off a cliff, you have to spend that reaction to try to hold on. This is an interesting decision because something else might use your reaction. And if you are standing at the edge of a cliff, maybe you want to save that reaction. Uh, again, interesting decisions. So the benevolent tyranny of Pathfinder's three action economy. Pathfinder has defined rules for certain things costing a certain number of actions. And I would argue that this makes the game deeper and more tactical. The first strength is that it fosters interesting consequential decisions. The most important part of the three action economy is not that it gives you more actions than other systems. It's that it gives you not enough actions to do everything you want to do. And all actions are exchangeable with each other because they are the same type. This fosters those interesting decisions. The next strength is that it creates a controlled progression in ability of your player characters from level 1 to 20. One of my D&D YouTuber players commented that in 5e, an ability will tend to let you just do something you want to do. Whereas in Pathfinder, you'll get some situational or small numerical bonus. So let's look at one example. In D&D, there's a feat called Athlete. When you take it, climbing does not cost you extra movement. So you can climb up a wall just as fast as you would hustle on the ground horizontally. Whereas in Pathfinder, you can take Combat Climber, which simply reduces the number of hands you need by one, and you are not flat-footed or off guard while climbing. But that's not the end of your advancement with climbing in this game. In Pathfinder, as you level up, you get to take a skill feat at every even-numbered level. And at levels 3, 7, 11, 15, and 19, you can take a general feat, which can be used as a skill feat. So there are plenty of feats you can take. And one of them, when you become a master in athletics, which you can do at level 7, you get skill increases to your skills. You're not limited to just being proficient to non-proficient. You can get progressively better from non-proficient to trained to expert to master to even legendary. You can take the quick climb of feet, which lets you move plus five more feet on a success and plus 10 more feet on a critical success. But when you become legendary in athletics, the game has you set. You gain a climb speed equal to your speed. So you get at level 15 what you would get at level 1 in D&D. However, the game gives you tangible, observable progression from level 1 to 15 in this instance. It's playing the long game. So all of these rules and limitations and costs we've gone over in this video, there is a way to cheat those rules if you take feats. Here's a level 2 rogue feat called Quick Draw. Costs a single action to draw a weapon and attack with it with the same action. You can have 10 daggers on your person and attack three times with them. At level 1, some marshals can take Sudden Charge, which lets them spend two actions to stride two times and make an attack. At level 1, a fighter can take Reactive Shield, where an enemy hits them with a melee attack and they can raise their shield and give them a plus two circumstance bonus to their AC to that triggering attack. This saves you from having to spend an action on your turn to raise your shield. But also, interestingly enough, it uses your reaction. So you still have an incentive to raise your shield because fighters can also shield block and soak the damage like I explained earlier with their reaction. Again, interesting choices and feats can give you more choices. More cheating feats are, well, if you become master in acrobatics, you can kip up. Instead of spending an action to stand up, you can spend a free action to stand up, and it does not trigger reactions. So that giant who trips you and hopes to hit you on your way up has completely wasted their effort if you have this feat. I didn't go over the leap action, but if it's interrupting your movement, you have to spend an action to move up to the point where you leap, spend an action to leap, spend a third action to keep walking. It also costs you two actions to stride and do a long jump that goes farther than a leap. Well, there are feats that 
let you be better in this regard. Quick jump lets you do a long jump or high jump as a single action without having to travel 10 feet first. And if you're a master in athletics, you can take wall jump where you're basically Mario. <laughs> you can jump up to a wall and then do a high jump or long jump off of it. This feat improves as you level up. You normally are limited to doing it once a turn, but when you become legendary in athletics, you can do it any number of times on your turn, as long as you have actions. When you become legendary in athletics, you can take cloud jump, which lets you move triple your long jump result uh, as long as you spend actions. You can even jump vertically whatever your long jump results would be. So 40 feet up um, and more. So I think this offers a useful contrast between the two systems. In 5e, your ability to climb half your speed up a wall is pretty super heroic. Whereas Pathfinder is more grounded, you spend one action, about two seconds, to climb only five feet, and you have to have both of your hands free. Kind of more like real life. Pathfinder starts you off more grounded, but it has higher heights, as we can see with these feats. 5e is very front-loaded. The system gives you what you want right away, but you hit the ceiling right away also. With flight, you can get the third level spell fly or get boots of flying relatively early on and trivialize flight in the game. Whereas in Pathfinder, there's more of a worked out progression from level one to 20, and you have more to look forward to at higher levels. The way 5e is designed contributes to the fact that a lot of campaigns stop at levels eight, 10, or 12, because there isn't a whole lot else to look forward to uh, at those higher levels. Whereas Pathfinder has worked out worked out a progression of things you can look forward to from levels 1 to 20, and has planned out when at-will flight, for example, becomes available, usually level 13 or 15, as opposed to once-a-day flight, which is around level 9 from Ancestry feats. That's just one example. But yeah, you have a reason to look forward to level 19. Here's one feat called True Perception. If you are a legendary in Perception, this general feat gives you the constant effect of true seeing, letting you see illusions and invisible things all the time. Uh, rogues at level 18 can take this class feat, which is bonkers, implausible infiltration, which lets them, with two actions, go through a wall. And if they have a climb speed, they can go through a ceiling. The magical and fantastical is not the exclusive realm of spellcasters. Marshals can do stuff that legendary heroes of myth can do. That dovetails into our next strength of this benevolent tyranny, which is specialization and niche protection for characters. There's a complaint in 5e that your skills don't matter much, not only for the fact that magical spells might trivialize, let's say, a rogue's investment in stealth, by casting Pass Without Trace gives everyone in the party plus 10, or the Invisibility spell can be more effective than what most rogues can accomplish, or the spell Knock can trivialize the rogue's investment in Thieves' Tools. The other issue is that 5e doesn't really have a way for one character to express that they are better than somebody else when they specialize in something. The way that Pathfinder 2e limits what you can do at low levels allows characters who specialize in cast off those chains to feel like they are being rewarded for what they're doing. In 5e, you're either proficient in a skill or you're not. So the Barbarian and the Druid can both be proficient in the nature skill, and the Druid can put all of their points in wisdom and be higher level <laughs> than a Barbarian. But there's a fair chance with bounded accuracy that the Barbarian will do better than the Druid on that skill check. Another example is a Barbarian trained in athletics, and a rogue that's trained in athletics. They can both try to grapple that troll. However, the barbarian, even though they have a really high strength probably, might be less good at it than the rogue because of the rogue's expertise class feature, which lets the rogue double their proficiency bonus to certain skills. And even if the rogue does not have a higher bonus, dumb luck might determine that the rogue is going to out-wrestle the barbarian. In Pathfinder, there are different levels of proficiency. That barbarian who's level 7 can become a master in athletics, while the rogue is still trained or expert. The GM can say that some tasks, like forcing open a steel door, are just not possible to a character that is less than master at the athletic skill. Also, being proficient or better gives you access to more and more skill feats. If you are trained in athletics, 
you can take Titan Wrestler. Let's say our Barbarian takes that. In Pathfinder, like in 5e, you cannot grapple a creature that's more than one size category larger than you. So our rogue is limited to grappling a troll. However, the barbarian, after taking this feat, can grapple an adult red dragon. And when they become legendary in athletics, they can grapple something three size categories larger. So the largest size category in the game, Gargantuan, they can grapple a Tarrasque. By setting upper limits, Pathfinder can raise those limits and reward players who specialize in things and not just leave things up to the DM to make a call. The next thing these rules do is foster balance in the game. The three action economy lets you make more than one attack per turn, yes, but it also limits the number of attacks you can make per turn. A level 20 fighter can make just as many attacks as a level one fighter. Well, barring a level 20 feat that they could take, but that's optional. Pathfinder, instead of giving marshals extra attacks as they level up, represents their greater martial proficiency by giving them numerical bonuses to their attack rolls, and also allowing them to slap runes onto their weapons so that they get more damage dice on their weapons. And of course, there are class feats and features that can improve their damage performance. But what this means is that everyone has one most accurate attack per round. Well, nearly everyone. There's a few feats that are exceptions. But this means that even the monk who can make two attacks with one action is subject to the multiple attack penalty. The flurry of blows action, its benefit is not to give the monk more attacks, but to give the monk more actions. What this all means is that it's easier to balance the game and easier to balance how Marshall's DPR, let's say, will progress as they go from level one to 20. In 5e, balance goes out the window <laughs> after a certain level. There's no effort to the control the number of attacks martial characters can make that's uniform across levels. Fighters can make four attacks eventually per round. They also have action surge that they can use once per short rest to double their number of attacks, whereas other marshals only have two attacks per round. Rogues are playing their own game where they have sneak attack, which they can use once per turn, that they want to maximize as much as possible. Summoning works differently between the systems as well. In D&D, you can summon extra creatures, and each of them has the same number of actions as you do. Spells like conjure animals and animated objects give you 8, 10, 16, 32 more creatures to make attacks with on your turn. Not only does it make it harder to balance the math of the game, but it also leaves other players bored as you adjudicate all of your attacks. Whereas Pathfinder has rules for minions, you spend one of your three actions to let that minion do two actions. It's controlled. Which is another pain point, by the way, for people coming from other systems. They want to summon more creatures, but there's a justification for this rule. In 5e, it's the Wild West. Another consequence of this lack of tyranny <laughs> is that in 5e, different characters in different turns will be doing different numbers of actions depending on the situation. A cleric might use all of their available actions in 5e's action economy. They can interact with an object, move their speed, cast an attack cantrip, and cast healing word or spiritual weapon as their bonus action. Meanwhile, the fighter over there that's locked in melee is not going to move, it's not going to interact, might not have a bonus action that they want to use this turn at least, and they're only going to make their attack action. This becomes a point of imbalance between character builds even. Um, there's now a meta that's emerged about how to use your bonus action, where some feats Crossbow Expert and Polar Master are considered essential in the optimization community because they let you use that otherwise wasted action to do damage. The system rewards you with more attacks and more actions if you can find them, like getting more candy out of a pinata. But this means that there's more imbalance between different character builds, and it fosters the kind of ivory tower design that is often maligned for third edition D&D, where the designers admitted to making some options stronger than others, and rewarding those players who optimize their characters and engage with the meta. One fighter who knows how to game the action economy in 5e will do better than another person who wanted to prioritize their backstory more than optimizing and damage. Meanwhile, in Pathfinder, instead of some characters having more actions than others, everyone has the same number, three. That also creates a stable design space to balance classes and actions in. Uh, okay, one last point is that this benevolent tyranny 
allows for awesome three action abilities that are awesome. There are some very strong activities in this game. The three action version of heal lets you heal every living creature in a 30 foot radius, including yourself, and do damage to undead creatures. However, you get to do that at the cost of standing still and foregoing all the other possible things you can do on your turn, including just walking or interacting with an object. Making things cost an action means that there is an interesting decision involved with using Whirlwind Strike, a three action activity that lets you strike any creature you'd like within your reach. This also rewards setup and planning because you want to be standing in the precise place. There's other abilities that require you to stand in place for two rounds and spend six actions over the course of two rounds, such as the Pathfinder version of Kamehameha. Pathfinder's decisions with its action economy opens up the design space to make these blockbuster things happen, but at the interesting cost of foregoing everything else you can do on your turn. So that's it. If you enjoyed the video, definitely like and also subscribe and ring the bell. I do other deep dives into Pathfinder's design and also will be continuing my law school series. This was a companion video to my course on the three action economy. And I have other courses in the law school series that go over different parts of the system that teach the system, but also explain why I think it's awesome. So what do you think? Um, definitely comment below and also join my discord as well, where we talk about Pathfinder 2E and other gaming. Also, we have a drop in Pathfinder 2E campaign where you can take your character from adventure to adventure and also support my Patreon, which allows me to continue making these videos and you get early access to many of my videos and also exclusive access to many videos, including me running Pathfinder 2E for D&D YouTubers. So that's it. I hope you enjoyed the video. I've been Ronald, the rules lawyer, and I'll see you next time.